A couple of years ago, I was going to the gym with a member of, of my church. And uh, we would go and uh, talk about the Lord and, and work out together. And as a part of this workout that we were doing this particular day, we were jumping rope uh, for a little bit. Now, now, this is going to sound weird, but one thing I want you to know about me is that I think I'm really, really good at jumping rope. Now, that, that's the lamest brag you've ever heard, uh, but it's true. I, I think I'm an expert jump roper. I've been doing it a long time. I can jump fast. I can go double time, skip, run in place, all those kinds of things. Well, after we were through with the jump rope portion of our workout, my friend says to me, audacity. Hey, you know, you're making it too hard on yourself. If you would just kind of shorten up the rope a little bit and keep your arms in, you, you could jump rope much better. And I was speechless. Now, on the outside, I, I, I think I said something like, oh, okay, at jumping rope, I'm fine. Thank you very much. Now, I later found out that this guy was on some sort of competitive jump roping team when he was a kid. I didn't even know that was a thing, but he was, and so he's correcting my ability to jump rope. I'm not sure if you've ever had the experience of someone telling you to do something better that you already think you're kind of good at. It can be a little jarring. Maybe you think you're a seasoned traveler and someone tries to give you advice on how to more easily find flights and book hotels. And you say, listen, I've got this under control. Or there's an aspect of your job that you think is one of the things that you do best and your boss or a coworker tries to tell you an easier or a better way to accomplish those tasks and you think you're already doing it as, as, as good as you possibly can. Or maybe it's marriage advice or parenting advice or advice in school, but it's an area where you already feel highly competent and you and your pride, like me, can tend to bristle against that and fight back a little bit. Now, these examples can, can be humorous and, and trivial as we look back on them, but, but here's what I want you to consider this morning. If someone takes that same attitude with Jesus, or if somebody takes that same attitude with their Christian faith, it's no longer humorous, it is disastrous. Some of your most essential and needed growth in your Christian life will come in areas that you already think you're doing just fine. And if you're not both ready and eager to hear that, your growth as a Christian will be stunted. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 9 through 12, Paul is going to take an area where the Thessalonians are, are doing just fine. And he's going to say, guys, just fine is not the goal. I want you to excel in this area. Here's how and here's why. Turn in your Bibles to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 with me. We're going through a series in the book of 1 Thessalonians this summer. Find ourselves in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 verse 9 this morning. As we look at this passage, I want you to see that the key to Christian love is learning how to excel in Christian love. The key to Christian love is learning how to excel in Christian love. Our outline this morning as we look at 1 Thessalonians 4 will be rather simple. I have two points. One, Christians are to love. Point number two, Christians are to excel at love. Point number one, Christians are to love. We're going to see that in verse 9 and in the first half of verse 10. Point number two, Christians are to excel at love. That's going to be the second half of verse 10 and then verses 11 and 12 as well. 1 Thessalonians 4, verses 9 through 12. Now concerning brotherly love, you have no need for anyone to write to you. For you yourselves have been taught by God to love one another. For that is indeed what you are doing to all the brothers throughout Macedonia. But we urge you, brothers, to do this more and more. And to aspire to live quietly and to mind your own affairs and to work with your hands as we instructed you, so that you may walk properly before outsiders and be dependent on no one. 
Point number one, Christians are to love. Our passage begins with a couple of words where Paul says, now concerning. This is typical uh, Pauline approach when he's trying to uh, change topic to something that he is responding to. So if you remember that this uh, letter to the, the first, this first letter to the Thessalonians uh, takes place on one of Paul's missionary journeys where Timothy has just rejoined Paul and Sylvanus. And so he has brought a report back about how the, the Thessalonian church is doing. And, and something in that report had to do with the way that they were loving. And so Paul says, okay, now concerning brotherly love, he's addressing something that he heard from Timothy about what is going on in their church. Now concerning brotherly love, verse 9. The first thing to note here as we look at verse 9 is that Paul isn't just talking about love. His topic isn't just the topic of love. It is brotherly love. Now, brotherly love in classical Greek, this was a term that, that was used for the, the way that literal families loved one another. It's the way that, that husbands and wives would love each other and the way that parents would love their kids and the way that kids would love their parents and their grandparents. It, it was a word for love within a family unit in classical Greek. But in the New Testament, however, the, the New Testament authors kind of commandeer that word. They take that word Philadelphia and they take that word and they use it uh, in the context of the church to say that the love in a church is to be that kind of love, that familial family love. It's brotherly love and that's the way that love is to happen in the church. Now you might hear that and say, what's it matter? <laughs> it's, it's, good, it's good trivia, who cares? Uh, because whenever it comes to us loving each other, uh, we're going to express love practically. You're not going to rifle through a file in your mind of like, oh, what kind of love do I want to employ here? Right? Well, I don't know you very much, so I'm just going to show you regular love. And I, I know you a little bit better, and so I'm going, I'm going to show you brotherly love. So in, in a sense, like, right, that's not the way that love works. And so in a sense, what, what does it matter, the, the distinctions between the, the words uh, that, that are being used here and the type of love that Paul is talking about? Well, friends, there is a wonderful reality buried in this one word that Paul uses here in the way that he wants to talk about love and the church. The love that we are called to show one another is brotherly love, but be, because when we become Christians, we are called into a family. It is familial love because when we become Christians, we are called into a family. We are brothers and sisters in Christ. In fact, Jesus felt that there was a sense in, in which you're actually more related to, to Christians and to spiritual family than you are to your own biological family. Matthew chapter 12, he, uh, people come and say, hey, don't, don't you know that your, your mother and your brothers, they're, they're outside waiting for you? And he says, the, who are my mother and my brothers? These are my, bro my mother and my brothers. Whoever does the will of our father, that's my family. So he thought that, that there was a sense in which you're more related to spiritual family. Christ died to take different kinds of people people who would repent of their sins and trust in Jesus, people who would turn from sin and trust in Christ by faith. Jesus died to take those very different kinds of people, uh, old and young, men and women, poor and rich, male and female, all ethnicities. He died to take all of those people and bring them together in one family. If you're here this morning as, as, as a, as a non-Christian or if you're watching online as a non-Christian, the reason that we are all here isn't because we have the same tastes in politics or we have the same tastes in sports, we have the same taste in movies or books or food or hobbies. No, the, the reason that we're here is because we have all been made one family by Jesus. And so what does familial love look like? What does brotherly love look like in a, in a very real literal sense? And in asking that, I mean that ideally, right? We, we can all be in families that, that don't show familial love in a, in a good and healthy way. But in Paul's mind, he, he's not thinking of those abuses of, of love in a family. He's thinking of what should familial love look like ideally? Well, brotherly love endures and perseveres through pains, through, through trials, through good times and bad times. Brotherly love forgives and bears with one another. Through bad decisions and unkind words and awkward conversations, 
Brotherly love protects and provides an atmosphere for flourishing in the family. It's not a place in a family to use one another, to, to consume from one another, but to serve one another and platform one another and build one another up. It's a place where we defer to one another and celebrate one another. Brotherly love is intimate and it's deep. It's not surfacy and shallow, but really deep knowledge in your family of all the scars and all the stains and all the regrets and all the failures and all the joys and the successes and you love each other anyway. These are the characteristics of brotherly love in the church because we are one family in Jesus. And this is the way that he loves. His love is enduring and persevering. His love is forgiving and forbearing. His love is protecting and gives provision for flourishing. His love is intimate and it's deep. This is the way Jesus loves and we are brought into his family. And so when Paul says, church, I've got a word for you. I don't want to just talk about love. I want to talk about brotherly love because when Jesus saved her. So this is Paul's topic. He says, now concerning brotherly love. But look at what he says next. Concerning brotherly love, you have no need for anyone to say, uh, to write to you. For you yourselves have been taught by God to love one another. And then in verse 10, for that is indeed what you are doing to all the brothers throughout Macedonia. So Paul wants to address something about reasons that he gives. He says, one, you've been taught by God. So, so you guys know about, about, about brotherly love. And then two, he says, you're already doing it. You're already doing it and you're actually already doing it quite well. Now church, I want you to think about those two things because I think in a sense, those, very, those two same, same things are true of Delray Baptist Church. First, you, like the Thessalonians, have been taught by God about love and about your need to practice it. All right? Send it all up in Mark chapter 12. Love God and love neighbor. And Paul explained to the Galatians in Galatians chapter 5 that whenever we have the Spirit of God, when we trust in Christ and God's Spirit indwells us, that one of the things produced as fruit of that Spirit being in us is love. It's just the natural outworking of those who know Jesus and have the Spirit in us is that love is going to exude from us. Paul to the Roman church, Romans chapter 5 verse 5 he says that when we believe in Christ, the Holy Spirit is given to us. And then he says, God's love has been poured into your hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to you. So Delray Baptist Church, you've been taught by God. And so in that sense, you don't need any more teaching on it. We, we have, if, if we lack love, it, it's not an intellectual deficit. We've been taught to love. And so praise God for his revelation. Praise God for the fact that he brings that up by his spirit in us and that he has instructed us on our need to love and what love looks like. And second, just like this church in Thessalonica, I think we can say that we don't need more written on it because we show that we understand the concept. Right? Just as Paul could say to the Thessalonians that their love has been shown to everyone in their region of Macedonia. I think that's true here. Now, I haven't been around Delray Baptist Church for long, but, but I've seen this in so many ways in, in which the church, this church, practically shows love for one another. We moved in yesterday. This is day two of our being here in Alexandria. And we had, we had people bringing us food and people bringing us muffins and people coming to move stuff and assembling things. This church has loved us so well. And I've already seen that in the way that needs are thrown out there and people snatch those up right away and help one another and love one another. We, for the last six years, have been supported missionaries of this church as we lived in China. And, and so I can tell, just as the Thessalonian church, their love was famous throughout the region of, of Macedonia, I can tell you guys that your love is famous in the city of Shanghai, China, of 25 million people on the other side of the planet because of the ways that you love your supported workers well. And so I think the same thing is true. You've been taught by God to love, and you're already doing it. And so churches take that as, as a word of encouragement. When you look at 1 Thessalonians 4, verses 9 and 10, take that as a word of, an, of encouragement. And take it as, as a vision and a goal for what love can look like in the local church. 
We can love in such a way that our love can be experienced not just in here, but that our love can be experienced in a, in a massive, extensive, long-range, well-known way. Macedonia was a region encompassed by the, the modern-day regions of Greece, North Macedonia, Bulgaria, Albania, Serbia, and Kosovo. 26,000 square miles. And Paul says, Thessalonians, you've shown love that is famous I've heard about it. Others have heard about it. Your love has spread throughout this whole region of Macedonia. Others were talking about the way that they loved. It was well known. And that was in a day when resources were slimmer and travel was troublesome and communication was slower. And so we have an opportunity. Take this as an encouragement for how you're loving, but also an opportunity of where our love can go and what it can do. And so when you're financially giving to support this church, you're, you're doing that for, for, for things that are going on here, but you're also supporting missions and church planning in, in this region and all around the world. Your relationships as you scatter throughout the DMV and in your neighborhoods and where you work, serving others and having evangelistic conversations with others and seeking justice and righteousness where you live and the way that, that you are carrying yourself as a Christian, that is a way that our love is, is being well known and is being proclaimed throughout this whole region. Your ability in, in your community group to reach out and to show practical love in various parts of the city conversations and, and actions in pursuit of, of goodness and justice and righteousness. Man, what a vision that we see exemplified here by this Thessalonian church. Known for love, not just love, but brotherly love. Long range, famous, testimonials ready to be given, people ready to stand up and testify to the way that this church, that kind of love. So we want to love in here, but we want to love in such a way that, that, that we see this vision that, that they have be true in our own church as well. So they're doing great. Paul says, now concerning brotherly love, and the first thing he says is, well done. You're doing great. But, but, there's more to be said. Point number two, Christians are to excel at love. The, the key to Christian love is not just love, but learning how to excel at love. That is where our love is going to more closely resemble the love of Christ and the love that Paul has in mind here. Christians are to excel at love. Look again at the second half of verse 10. He says, but we urge you, brothers, to do this more and more. And to aspire to live quietly and to mind your own affairs and to work with your hands as we instructed you. So that you may walk properly before outsiders and be dependent upon no one. I'm not sure how this hits you. But for some people, reading this passage may confirm some of your worst fears about religion. Right? Somebody to come along and say, hey, you're doing well. You need to do more. You're doing okay, but but there's more work to be done. Now I can understand how that might sound like a burden to someone, but that's not the idea idea here at all. So if you read it that way, understand that's not what Paul is saying here. The reason that Paul urges them to do this more and more is because as Christians, our love is modeled on and in pursuit of and desiring to be like the very Son of God who loves us perfectly and infinitely. So then the, the love to which we were called is always pursued and never arrived at. Precisely because our Savior's love is so amazing. That the love that we are called to here is always practiced but never mastered. It's love that's experienced in a very real way by us, but never in any sense exhausted. Because it's in pursuit of Jesus, whose love is eternal, never tiring, never fading, perfect. That sounds nice. How do we know that's true? It's an easy thing for me to stand up here and say, how do we know that that's true, that that's the way that Jesus loves? Well, the Bible says greater love has no one than that they would lay down their life for their friends, John 15. 
That's what Jesus did. He he exemplified the greatest type of love that could ever be displayed by laying down his life in your place for the forgiveness of sins. The Bible says that God demonstrates his love for us. So how do I know God loves me? The Bible says he demonstrates his love for us. He shows us his love for us in this, that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Romans chapter 5. In this way, God loved the world. In this way, this is, how we, this is how we see God's love in the world. In this way, God loved the world that he gave his only begotten son so that whoever believed in him would not perish but have eternal life. John chapter 3. 1 John 4. In this, the love of God was made manifest. It was revealed. It was shown. It was made tangible to us. In this, God's love was manifest, made tangible among us that God sent his only son into the world so that we might live through him. Friends, do do you see Jesus' love shown to us in the gospel is the ultimate kind of love. That he would die for his enemies to make them his friends. That he would take the very wrath that we all deserve because of our sin And that he would stand in our place as our substitute and take God's wrath that we by repenting and trusting in him might have life. That is the ultimate perfect form of love. And then he said to his followers, you know how they'll know that you're my followers? By the way that you love. They'll know you're my disciples by your love. You love like me and everybody will know that you're a follower of me. So Paul looks at the church in Thessalonica and he says, church, you're doing well. You're doing well. Your love is great. It's well known. You don't need anybody to teach you anymore. You're doing a very, very good job at love. But it can be greater. Not because Jesus is demanding, but because Jesus is perfect. Your love can excel still more and more, not because you're trying to heap up works and we're always trying to give you a burden, but because Jesus' love is so fantastic and so outrageous and so unimaginable and so amazing that we are always in pursuit of it and never arriving at it. That's the good news of the gospel. So when you see this and he says, hey, you need to love more and more, it's not more works, it's not burden. It is, it is the opposite of that. It is a relief of our burden because we are pursuing a, a God who has loved us perfectly and infinitely. What an amazing truth. All right, now look at what he says next. What does this more and more look like? Verse 11. And his urging them to love more and more. Verse 11, he, he kind of identifies or outlines a little bit of what that looks like. He says to, to aspire to live quietly and to mind your own affairs and to work with your hands as we instructed you. And his urging them to love more and more, he, he gives some instructions. He fills this in a little bit. He says three things there. Aspire to live quietly. Mind your own affairs and work with your hands. The church at Thessalonica, it seems, had some problems. As loving as they were. As loving as they were, they had some members who were struggling with some things that actually hindered the church's ability to be as loving as it could be. I just think that's a, let me just pause for a bit of application right there, that that we would realize that there are ways that we interact with each other. We'll we'll get to these three things and specifically what he is driving at here for the church at Thessalonica. But there there are ways, and maybe you can even think more broadly, there are ways that as loving as our church is, as, as well as you guys support missionaries around the world, as quickly as you snatch up needs on the DRBC Google group, as well as we're doing those kinds of things, that there are still ways that we can interact with one another, ways that we can hinder the net influence of the love of our church by the way that we're acting with one another. I, that's, I love that about this passage. It's so realistic, isn't it? He doesn't just pump them up and be like, man, you guys are loving and you guys are just doing great. But he also just doesn't beat them down and say, you guys still have more work to do and you need to grow in your love. It, it's, it's both and. Yeah, you're doing great. Yeah, you have work to do. And then, I don't know about your life, but that's what it feels like for me. The things that you're doing well and you can still do better. 
you can still pursue Christ more faithfully. And so just, that's just something to, to meditate on or to talk about with somebody over lunch today or with a family member of, man, what are, what are some ways, as loving as we are, that we could actually be hindering our, our church's ability to fully love and to excel at love by, by our attitudes, by our speech, by maybe something that we're not doing that we could be doing, conversations we're not having that we could be having. This is a reality. So he gives them three things. You, you might categorize these three things as, as restlessness, meddlesomeness, and idleness. So these are things you guys need to excel at love. Here, here are three ways that, that I see this as a deficiency, Paul says, to the church at Thessalonica. There's a restlessness among them. There's a meddlesomeness among them. And there's an idleness among them. Let's think a bit about each one of those. Restlessness. He says, I want you to aspire to live quietly. Now, of course, he doesn't mean a literal quiet in, this, in the sense of, of not speaking. But he's rather pointing to, to more of a, of a quietism of life. That, that isn't constantly provoking one another. It isn't constantly demanding from one another. Such people, just, they just have no chill. They're always rushing into the next controversy. They're a busybody. No ability to, to just rest and to be uninvolved in whatever is swirling around them in the world. You ever get really worked up about something that people are debating online? And, th and then you ask a friend, hey, what would you think about what so-and-so said about so-and-so? And they were like, I have no idea what you're talking about. It's basically my conversation with my wife. Every time I bring something up, you see what that person's saying about that person, how this person over here re responded to that. And she's like, I haven't seen any of that. I've been busy doing other important things. And, and so that, that's how it happens. So if you've ever had that experience with somebody, have you ever thought, man, your life is just worse off? You're, you're, I actually pity you for not being kind of the Christian TMZ and, and just knowing like what is going on all the time. I actually feel bad for you. No, how do you feel? You're always like, man, can I switch places with you? Can I have that time back that I just wasted on that? Can I have the emotional uh, energy and uh, can, can I get that back somehow? That, that's how I always feel when I, when I bring something up. So I was like, I don't, I don't even know what's going on. Well, there are people in this church who, who are just, they're, they're restless. They, they, they're not living a quiet life. They're busybodies. They're always buzzing around and, and involved in everything that's going on. Now, now listen, there are times, there are things that we need to be aware of. There are things that are going on that we, we should be conversant in and, and, and be able to speak on and, and be involved in. We can't just lock ourselves up and, and never uh, know what is going on around us. There's time to, to advocate for certain things, assuredly. But if that is just where you live all the time, that's just, you're, you're just a constant revolutionary. I think Paul would say, guys, you need to live a quiet life a little bit. And if you have a church where everybody is restless, Paul would say that, man, that is going to be hard for us to excel in love. It will be hard on the church because restlessness necessarily ropes other people into it. Necessarily so. In order to excel in love more and more, we'll need to aspire to, to live quietly in some sense. Friends, you might, you might even ask a family member or a friend this week or today and just ask them honestly and say, hey, is there, is there any area in my life that I'm, I'm really blowing it on this, that I'm failing to live quietly, that I'm just, I'm restless in some way? We all have blinders on. I'm sure I do as well. So it's helpful for other people to speak into our life and say, yep, yeah, Honestly, I think, I think you could dial it back a little bit on this to help you live more quietly and to be a little less restless. It will help us love well in the church. Well, that, that's similar to the second issue here in verse 11, meddlesomeness. Meddlesomeness. He says, I want you to aspire to live quietly and to mind your own affairs. Now, again, of course, there is a godly concern that we are to have for one another that is good and that is right. The Christian life is not privately lived. So you can't just go around and say, hey, First Thess 4, get out of my business. 
You can't, don't ask me that question. That's off limits because Paul said, don't meddle. That, that's not what's going on here, right? So there's a sense in which we need to, to be, love. I think, what's Garrett call it? Like lovingly intrusive or something like that. Like th- there's a sense in which we need to, to be involved in each other's lives. We, in fact, we actually can't obey other commands we have in Scripture to encourage, exhort, rebuke, correct, guard one another. We actually can't do that if we're given to a isolated individualism. So we need to be involved in each other's lives. But meddlesomeness or an inability to, to, to mind your own affairs is just an, an insidious danger in the church. If we're constantly baiting one another with social media posts, I'm just going to throw this out there and see what people say about it. If we're, we're never overlooking an offense, never forbearing, somebody crosses us and we, we just... We can't just let that go and let that slide for once. We always have to kind of jump in on that. If, if every pet peeve and every soapbox is a hill to die on, it's going to be a problem. You're going to be meddling. Inability to mind our own affairs. Here's a proverb for you to memorize this week. Whoever meddles in a quarrel not his own is like one who takes a passing dog by the ears. Proverbs 26, verse 17. Whoever meddles in a quarrel, not his own, is like one who takes a passing dog by the ears. So you have, you have a stray dog, you have a white, which in this day, dogs would have been more like jackals. Just wild dog running by. And if there's a jackal running by, and you're like, hey, I'll just twist that thing's ear. <laughs> like that, that's the image here. I'm just, gonna, I'm just gonna grab that thing by the ear and see what happens. That, that is the image that this proverb has in mind, that, that, if, that if we're just meddling, that quarrel's not yours, that fight's not yours, and if I'm just going to go and start twisting dog's ears, you're going to have a whole lot of hurt, have a whole lot of issues that will spring up very, very quickly. Now, we're, we're all different in this constitutionally, and for some of us, this is really easy, and for some of us, this is really hard. So for me, I, 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 I'm one of the ones that needs to memorize Proverbs 26, 17 and quote it to myself frequently. Someone parks their car sideways, taking up three spots at Target. I'm going to leave a note. Like that's what I want to do. I, wanna leave, I actually want to wait by the car and just wait for the person to come out and say, why do you think you're so special? Like that's, that's just, that's in me somewhere. This is a pastoral confession time. Someone posts something ridiculous online. I have to say, Jason, Proverbs 26, 17, you don't have to comment. You don't, you just leave it alone. Let other people waste their time on that. A family at the neighborhood park that, let's say, has different parenting decisions than what we've made. And I've got to say, Jason, Proverbs 26, 17, it's not your job to discipline everybody's kids. Just let it go. I, I have to memorize that and repeat that to myself meddlesomeness disrupts, hinders love in the local church. We cannot excel at love if we can't on some level mind our own affairs. We're just not going to be able to be loving. I mean, we will be loving in a sense in the ways that we are, but we're not going to be able to excel in love. We will be hindered in our love if we in some sense can't mind our own affairs. And I've already given the disclaimer that that doesn't mean that which completely mind our own business. There's ways that we need to be involved that falls on the short of, of, of being meddlesome and just poking our nose where it doesn't need to be. So maybe this week you would memorize Proverbs 26, 17. Memorize that verse and, 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 or some other passage that might be helpful to you and reminding yourself that you don't need to correct every fool on the internet. <laughs> every pet peeve isn't a hill to die on. Our meddlesomeness will hurt our ability to excel at love. So in Thessalonica, they had some folks who were restless, kind of living loud, busy bodies. They had some folks who were meddlesome, up in everybody else's business all the time. And to that, Paul adds a third one here. He says idleness, idleness. So aspire to live quietly and to mind your own affairs and to work with your hands. Now, if you read on and get to 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, this, this problem right here, this idleness, actually is just exploding in the church. 
Paul says in First Thess, or Second Thess, uh, chapter three, he says, "If you don't work, you don't eat." <laughs> I mean, they, they were really abusing this. And there were people that were just kind of freeloaders in that congregation. And it was really draining the resources of the church. And so, Paul, if you, you can read, read later today, 2 Thessalonians 3, this was, a, this was a big problem in the church at Thessalonica. But they were refusing to, to work to the point that they were becoming a drain on the rest of the church. Now, listen, there, there are reasons why, why any of us in this room may be uh, unable to work for a season. Maybe, maybe a physical or mental health reason, maybe the job market or the, the difficulties in your specific industry. Maybe there's a pandemic, let's say. Right, right, so there's reasons, but certainly you see by now that Paul, Paul's meaning here isn't just that somebody's unemployed. That's not his point. How dare you be unemployed? That's not what he's talking about here. Something deeper and something different than that. It's not just employment status. That's a concern of Paul. It's how you're acting and what you're doing with your time and how your situation is starting to impact and affect others in the church. So you could be unemployed and just being really lazy, not pursuing employment, not really caring, all the while just sucking resources from others. I think that may be what was going on here in Thessalonica. So, so that could be true. And in that sense, that Paul would be speaking in this and writing this directly to you. Work with your hands. Or you could be quite industrious at work, but still be idle. You could have a job, but still be idle in it. I don't know if you've read the, uh, the book, uh, The Gospel at Work, Greg Gilbert and Sebastian Traeger. The, the two big dangers in that book when they talk about uh, what our work looks like is those who are, are, have uh, an idol of work and those who are idle at work. So you've made work into kind of a, an idolatry of work, that work is your whole life. And then others for whom you're just, you, you got to work, but you're just kind of checking in, checking out, and, and, and you're idle at work. So you, you could still have a job but be idle. Or you could still have a job and, and not be idle at work, but, but in the rest of your life you're just idle. Right? So you work really hard, nine to five or whatever it is, and, and you come home and that's just it. You're done. Not engaging in your community, not engaging with your kids, not engaging with your family, not uh, practicing hospitality, not reaching out to others. You're just done. Your work gets all your time and nothing else does. So, so don't look at this and be like, hey, I'm not idle. I got a job. Paul would say, if, if, you're, if you're idle in the rest of your life, this still applies. Or you can be really diligent with your personal development at work, but be really... Uh, really lazy in your spiritual development and your spiritual maturity. Always trying to climb that ladder, always trying to get to the next place in your industry and uh, resources and opportunities and making the most of those to grow professionally. When it comes to your spiritual life, you're just like, ah, go to church. That would be a, an, an idleness that is going to sap the church of love. If you're not working with your hands at your own spiritual maturity and spiritual health. F.F. F. Bruce commenting on this passage, he says that these folks in Thessalonica had a tendency to put less into the common stock than they took out. It's a good way to put it. It's like a common pot, a common stock right here. He says these people, they were, they, they were putting less in and then they were always taking out of it. Nothing will hinder love in the local church more than an unwillingness of the members of that local church to shoulder their part of the responsibility for it. Church, we cannot excel at love if we're idle. Whether that is being occupationally industrious or being intentional in our local church and with relationships, coronavirus season for us. Now, there are some senses in which kind of some, some, maybe some idleness has been forced on you. And, and maybe you kind of like it. Or maybe uh, non-attendance of, of, of church things has been forced on you. And, and, and maybe that's kind of enjoyable. It's a very dangerous season for us to become comfortable. Now again, I, I, everybody's different. People are in different situations and I understand that. I think that's where wisdom comes into play and having conversations with elders of the church and Christian friends about how much is too much and how far is too far and what we need to do. So I, so I understand that. But... I'm actually speaking from the future. I dealt with this for four months already on the other side of the world. 
So I, I come to you from the future to say that there's a really uh, real danger of, of hiding personal apathy or, or fear behind government submission. There's a real danger of, of hiding idleness behind the pandemic. I'm not saying that's everybody's situation. I'm saying for each of us to search our own hearts and consider that. Even I'm glad for the technology that we can zoom and we can do all those kinds of things. That is not ideal. That is not the way we're meant to be. And for some people, it is, man, I, you know, some people are falling into that trap. I don't, I don't know about this church. I haven't been here, so I'm not saying that about us. I'm just saying from other places I've been, it's been easy for people to fall into that trap and be like, man, Zoom's awesome. I can just sit in my underwear and watch church in the morning or whatever. In me, I, I, that's just never, I hate Zoom. <laughs> Not hate Zoom. I know people work for Zoom, I think, in this room. Uh, Zoom's great. But, but that, that experience is so much less than, than face-to-face, seeing your smiling eyes, <laughs> even masked up. That, there's just something life-giving about that. So we're in a dangerous spot right now that we need to, to, to constantly be pushing into community, even if we're taking precautions. Being careful that now we're, we're not being, becoming idle. Interestingly, just two weeks ago, Tim Challies, a name may be familiar to some of you, he's kind of a, an author and a pastor in Canada. Uh, he wrote a blog just two weeks ago called Respectable Sins of the Reformed World. Respectable sins of the reformed world. He, he offered six suggestions, six, six sins that are uh, acceptable in the sense that, that these things are not good, these things are dangerous, but we just kind of shrug them off and be like, eh, it's not, you know. There's other sins that we're going to focus on, those big ticket things that we're always going to rail against and talk about this, but these other things are fly under the radar and nobody's ever going to talk about them. Respectable sins of the reformed world. He gives six suggestions. You know what two of them are? Meddling and idleness. Isn't that interesting? It's exactly what Paul is talking about to the church at Thessalonica. And there's some sense in which today in our world that those two things, meddling in other people's business and becoming idle, are things that are dangerous and that will lead to us not being able to love one another and so f- fulfill the commands of God. Uh, we're just not going to call those out. So we cannot be unconcerned here. These things hinder Christian love. Let's conclude with verse 12. Look at the last verse of our passage. He draws a kind of a conclusion of this or shows the the, the reason or the result of all of this. He says, so that, so do all of this. You're going to excel more and more in love. Aspire to live quietly. Mind your own affairs. Dependent on no one. So he gives the result of this excelling love that he's outlined, and it's twofold. So that you may walk properly before outsiders, and so that you may be dependent on no one. Now again, there's, there's a, certainly a good sense. We're not, this isn't just pull yourself up by your own uh, abilities. He's not, he's not uh, commending that. There's a very real sense in which we need to rely on one another and be dependent on one another uh, in the church. We, we need each other. That, that's not what he's addressing here. He's speaking with specific reference to the reluctance to work that he just talked about, uh, that, that was hindering their love and their community. And so the twofold result of this teaching is, is you might say, a winsomeness with those outside the church and, and, and a life of social responsibility that gives platform to the gospel and commends Christ to others as we don't exist to, to serve, but, or we don't exist to be served, but to serve. That's the kind of life that is going to be showcased here. That we have a good reputation with people and that we're not dependent on anyone in the sense that we are here to to, to be a blessing, to to be life-giving, to lift others up, to make others flourish, to be a blessing and to, to pour out our lives for others, for their good and for God's glory. This commends Christ to others because this is the way he lived. Son of man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. 
We're not here to leech off of others, but to be a blessing and to pour our lives out for the faith of others. Delray Baptist Church, we're, we're a loving church. We really are. So well done. But remember that some of your most essential and needed growth will come in areas where you're already doing just fine. The key to Christian love is learning how to excel at Christian love for the good of our church and the community, to enhance our fellowship and to protect our witness. Let's pray for his help in doing that. Father in heaven, these are such important truths for us to grapple with. God, we thank you for the extent to which you've made us a loving church that we've Uh, gathered around your word, that we've been formed by it, that we've been shaped by it, that we know what it means to love. We know what it looks like to love. We're not here trying to just figure this out of our own wisdom, but that you've shown us and told us what it looks like to love. And indeed, the love that you've called us to, you've been leading us and teaching us from your word that we might excel in love at this church and that that love might be famous. Not that, that, that we would be famous, but that our Savior would be famous for the type of love that you bring to the world through us. We pray all this in the name of Christ. Amen.